Hi, this is Miss Crib, and welcome to Chapter 13. Uh, I <clears throat> do the best I can with the audio, so I hope that you'll be able to um, to understand it. So here we go. Let's try this. We have something to watch. Okay, so they um, he got his tongue stuck to that pole because of something called heat transfer and also because of the specific heat of the pole. And so we'll come back to this in a little bit and, and continue on. I wanted to show you that there are a bunch of tutorials in this particular chapter and they're here located at the beginning of the Prezi and they'll also be at the end of the Prezi so that you can um, access them if you need to. So we're going to start with our notes. So pull out your notes for chapter 13. I'm going to kind of go back and forth between the notes and also the, um, the Prezi itself. So thermochemistry. Thermochemistry, uh, the branch of science that studies the transfer of energy during chemical reactions or phase changes. Temperature, remember, is an average kinetic energy. We did something like this before. And heat is the total amount of energy. Remember, I, I boiled some water and I dropped some boiling water on your hands with just a drop and you, weren't, you didn't get scalded. And that's because the amount of heat contained in that small drop was small. But if I had poured the entire beaker of hot water on you, I would have given a whole bunch of thermal energy to you and scalded you. So these are, av the average kinetic is just taking all the particles and looking at how much movement there is and dividing it and and that gives you temperature and, and so these are things we've done in the past a joule is the unit <coughs> for work and can be measured for any kind of energy so we're going to use kilojoules primarily in, in our calculations in this chapter uh, because it's impossible to determine the absolute amount of heat in something chemists measure the change in energy and that is delta h and we're going to cover that and uh, learn how to calculate it um, that change in energy is, is enthalpy, the enthalpy of a chemical reaction. Enthalpy, think of thermometers and thermostats, they all have the th sound, and enthalpy deals with heat. So the H is for heat, it's the heat content of a system. And one particular device that measures this is a calorimeter. Um, we may not have a chance to work with one of these, but I'm going to show you one. Uh, it's an insulated container like a thermos and we, you put a reaction in it and you see how much the temperature changes when you mix the two things together. And, and we use this to calculate enthalpy. Let's look at a couple of videos. Now first of all, this is, the, this is what a calorimeter looks like. Um, we have something where, where, where um, a reaction is going on and we're looking to see the change in the temperature as the reaction takes place. We're not going to use a bomb calorimeter though. We would use, if we did one, we do a coffee cup. In this first lesson on thermochemistry, we're going to distinguish between temperature and heat. 
and we're going to talk about the difference between endothermic and exothermic. Thermal chemistry is the study of the heat change in chemical reactions. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of particles. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So as the kinetic energy or the motion of particles increases, the temperature increases as well. So we've already said the temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a substance. Heat, on the other hand, is the flow of energy from a higher temperature to a lower temperature. So temperature is a measure of energy and heat is the flow of energy from higher temperature to lower temperature, from hot to cold. So the, the thermometer measures temperature, but heat flows. Heat goes from the hotter to the colder. Thermal equilibrium is reached when two objects at different temperatures in contact with each other reach the same temperature. So here we have a picture of some substance, hot substance, it's red, um, 7 degrees Celsius substance in uh -huh. an ice bath, a 5 degrees Celsius ice bath. Over time, the heat leaves the hot 70 degree uh, container and, go and enters the ice bath, warming it up. And at some point, the two temperatures are equal, and then they're said to be in thermal equilibrium. So how is this thermal equilibrium achieved? Here we have a microscopic view of this coffee mug filled with hot coffee. Here's the hot coffee on the left. Notice that these particles are moving faster than the particles of air on the outside. You can tell by the, they have longer tails. And the, the ceramic mug, the molecules are pretty orderly. What happens is that because of the large kinetic energy of the, of the molecules in the coffee, they hit these, the wall of the coffee mug pretty frequently. When they hit the wall of the coffee mug, they transfer some of their kinetic energy to the um, molecules in the ceramic mug, so they're going to be vibrating more. And what happens is the molecules in the vibrating mug, the kinetic energy of those molecules, hit molecules outside in the air, transferring their kinetic energy to molecules in the air. So the kinetic energy goes from the coffee through the mug to the air. The air around the coffee mug warms up because it gains some kinetic energy. The coffee and the mug cool down a little because they lose some kinetic energy. All right. Now, we're, not, we're going to watch just a little bit of this next video. Again, it has a bomb calorimeter in it. But we really only just want to see the coffee cup one. In thermodynamics, we're constantly trying to measure these quantities of energy that go in or out of the reactions. Uh, the question should come up, you know, how do you trap energy and measure it? I mean, Moving from out of the reaction, where does it go? How do you catch it and how do you measure it? Calorimetry is the answer to this. Uh, it's actually a pretty clever technique. What we do is we take a substance that we know very well how it responds to heat. Our favorite is water. And we're basically going to run a reaction and let all of the heat out or in from that reaction go into the water. What we do then is we measure the water's change in temperature, which allows us to figure out how much heat went into the water, and then we conclude, ah, that heat came from the reaction. So we know exactly how much heat comes out of the reaction. Now, it does require a little bit of planning ahead. You have to build yourself a calorimeter. Now, we have two types of calorimetry. We have constant pressure and constant volume calorimetry. I'll start with the easy one. Constant volume, oh, I'm sorry, constant pressure is the easy one. We'll get to the volume in a minute. Constant pressure calorimetry. We also call it coffee cup calorimetry, which will help you remember that it's super easy to make. When we say coffee cup, what we really mean is a cheap styrofoam cup. Uh, heck, go crazy. Get two styrofoam cups and stick them in each other. You've got yourself the perfect coffee cup calorimeter. Fill it up with some water. Maybe put one of your reactants in. Maybe you put some acid in it so it's got acid floating in your cup of water. Now take some base, have a thermometer in it, and pour it in. Stir. That temperature will change, especially if you do something like hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide. 
it's an exothermic reaction, so therefore it gives off heat, and sure enough, the temperature will rise in that solution. And it's real easy to measure the start and the finish. Look at the thermometer before, pour it in, stir, look at it when it stops. You've got yourself a delta T. From that delta T, you simply multiply that by the heat capacity of the water, which is 4.184 joules per gram per degree C, and you multiply it by the mass of the water, which you can easily weigh by sticking it onto a scale. Put all that together and you've got your amount of heat, which we call Q. That amount of heat is what was released from the reaction. That's an extensive property. We know the amount. Now you divide it by how much stuff you used, the amount of heat per gram or heat per mole, and you've got yourself the answer to the actual reaction you just ran. That's coffee cup calorimetry. Okay, and that's all we need. We only need coffee cup calorimetry. Um, we may have a chance to go through one of those little coffee cup calorimeter experiments, and if we do, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll fit it in and, and play around with it some. The next part is we're going to deal now with looking at sensible heat versus latent heat. I think I didn't cover that yet. Sensible heat produces a temperature change. You can sense it. You can feel it getting hotter or colder. You can sense it. Latent heat, I call it latent lazy heat. That's just a way to remember it because it's laying flat. There's no temperature change when latent heat is, is introduced. Um, you just get a phase change. It goes from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a gas. So I have this picture here in the Prezi and I have a similar one in your notes that you can copy down some of this. The lazy, there's the lazy areas. Those are the latent heat areas. Latent, the first one right here, this one is the latent heat of vaporization. So that's the amount of heat it takes to vaporize something, to go from a liquid to a gas. So we're right here at the beginning, we have a liquid, and on the other side we have a gas, and the amount of energy it takes us to go from the liquid to the gas is the latent heat of vaporization. Notice that the temperature does not change. And this is the latent heat of fusion. I'm really not really sure why they call it that, but um, we, get, we have a solid right here. See the solid? And the temperature does not change. It stays exactly in the same spot. All the additional heat that we're putting in goes to change it from a solid to a liquid. And the amount of heat that takes is called the latent heat of fusion. And we'll be able to calculate those. So latent, lazy heat. The sensible heat areas are these where the temperatures are going up. And we're going to use different formulas for each step of this process. Again, latent heat, when you add latent heat, you change the phase. You go from a melt, uh, solid to melting, from melting to vapor. That's adding extra heat. And when you take it away, you release it, you let go of it, you go from a vapor to a liquid and from a liquid to a solid. So it depends on if you add heat, you go up to a gas. If you take heat away, you go down to a solid for the latent heat. And that brings us to molar enthalpy of fusion. It's one of the first kind of new terms that you need to figure out. Molar, remember we're talking about moles, how many moles of something. Enthalpy is that heat, the delta H, the H. And then fusion, the amount of heat that has to be added to overcome the intermolecular forces so a solid can melt. Remember, intermolecular forces, dipole-dipole, uh, dispersion, uh, hydrogen bonds. So how much heat does it take to to pull the molecules away from each other so they go from a solid and to a liquid. This is a latent heat. This is and it is defined as the quantity of heat required to melt one mole. That's why it says molar. One mole of a solid to a liquid with no temperature change. And the unit is usually kilojoules per mole. And um, then we also have the molar enthalpy of vaporization, which is delta H VAP. So this one is delta H of fusion. And this is the delta H of vaporization, so you'll need to write that in. The amount of heat required to convert a mole of liquid to, to the boil, at the boiling point to vapor. So we're changing it from a liquid to a gas at the boiling point to vapor. And it stays the same temperature. molecular forces 2. So in this uh, lecture we're going to talk about the heat of fusion, 
heat of vaporization, vapor pressure, and phase change diagram. Right? Mm -hmm. So here we see a uh, phase change, a change of state for, say, uh, any substance. Okay? Let's say we use water. Here we have temperature, and here we have heat. Heat is the energy put in, right? So as you start, basically you're solid, and then when you get to a certain point, so now if this was water, this point right there would be basically zero degrees Celsius. Okay, so this is change state for water, and we're going to say this is water. So at zero degrees Celsius, all the heat you put in, basically from here to here, is called a heat of fusion. <coughs> and that heat of fusion is the energy needed to change a solid into a liquid. So all the energy in here is used to change that. Once all the solid is a liquid, then all the energy you put in is to raise the temperature of that liquid until you get here. Now at this point for water would be 100 degrees Celsius. So at this point, we're changing a liquid into a gas. So here, all the energy you put in is to change a liquid into a gas. So it's the delta H of vaporization, how much heat you put in per mole. Then after that, it's going to become a gas and so on and so forth. Okay? Okay, now that's all we're going to watch of that one. We're going to practice just a little bit um, and look at our sheets, a um, reference sheet. So i got to go to your notes for a moment. Oh, hold on. All right, here we are. Um, let me get it on pencil. There we go. Uh, we are going to calculate how many kilojoules of energy it takes to melt 56.9 degrees of ice. So we're dealing with water here. We're still dealing with water. All right. So I have uh, 50, now this is in kilojoules. Now you're going to have a reference sheet, and I pulled the reference sheet up, here it is, for chapter 13, it looks kind of complex, um, it has a lot of numbers on it. So in order to use this reference sheet, we need the delta heat of, okay, we're melting ice, so delta heat of fusion. And so um, we can look up here and see if I can find it. I've got, uh, there it is. We've got the delta heat of vaporization right there. Delta H of vaporization and delta H of fusion over here. So you should be looking at your reference sheet. For water, the delta H of fusion is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. 6.01 kilojoules per mole. So let's go back to our notes. Um, the delta H, the delta H of fusion is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. And I'm going to calculate how many kilojoules it takes to melt 56.9 moles of ice. So I don't have to do any changing mass to moles. I just take 56.9 moles of ice and I'm going to say it takes 6.01 kilojoules for every one mole. Moles cancel and I just have to multiply those two together to get the answer. I'm going to pull this up. So on uh, 56.9 9 times 6.01, that's 341.96. So 341.96, and I look at sig figs, 3 sig figs, three, whoops, 342 kilojoules. It takes 342 kilojoules of energy to melt 56.9 moles of ice. That, and we got that by using this molar heat of fusion, the delta H of fusion from and it says fusion there, but the F stands for fusion from the reference chart. Now, how many kilojoules does it take to turn 34 grams of water from a liquid to a solid? Well, liquid to a solid, we are going to be, um, we're going to be cooling it back off. So here we're adding this energy right here. We're adding 30, 342 kilojoules of energy to melt the ice. Now we're going to go in the opposite direction. We're going to be we have, if we had the warming curve, we'd, ha we'd be having ice on this side and a liquid on that side. We're, we, if we first went this way to a liquid, so we added energy. Now we're going to go the opposite way. We're going to take away energy. But I start with 34 grams of water. And since the delta H of fusion, that's what you use in this area, the delta H of fusion. So there's the liquid. It goes up. And here we have liquid. And on the other side, it was a, it's a gas on the warming curve. So here we use the delta H of fusion, I mean a vaporization, because it's turning into a vapor, into a gas. We're still dealing with this area right down here. Okay, 
Now we did one this way, now we're going to do one the opposite way. We're still dealing with the delta H of fusion because we're just going using the latent heat between those two points. So now I have 34.0 grams of water. And since the latent heat of fusion deals with moles, kilojoules per mole, I got to figure out how many moles I have first. And so you need the molar mass of water. So one mole is, and water is 18.02 grams. And you just have to do the molar mass first. That's the molar mass, okay? The grams cancel. And we'll be able to figure out how many moles of water I have. 34 divided by 18.02. It's a 1.8, 1.89, 1 1.89 moles of water. And so now I take those 1.89 moles of water and I multiply it by 6.01 kilojoules per mole. The moles cancel. So 1.89 times, six, uh, whoops, back, back up, times 6.01. That's 11.4, 11.4 kilojoules. Now, this is the amount of energy, how much energy does it take to turn, that's how, how much we have to release. We have to release this energy. We have to release 11.4 kilojoules, or we'd say it takes a negative 11.4 kilojoules of energy. We're losing, we have to lose that energy. Here we had to add it, so the energy was positive. Here we have to take it away, so the energy is negative. All right, how many kilojoules does it take to turn 34 grams of water from a liquid to a gas? Well, that puts us, on this picture up here, that puts us at this spot. We're going from liquid, that's the liquid, L-I-Q, it's kind of sloppy, to the gas. So we need the delta H of vaporization now of water. So i got to look that up. What's the delta H of vaporization? The energy it takes to turn it from a liquid to a gas. So I'm going to pull up my reference chart. The delta H of vaporization for water is 40.7 kilojoules per mole, which is a lot. So 40.7 kilojoules per mole. It takes that much energy for every one mole. Now I've already calculated up here the number of moles that I had, 1.89 moles. And I'm going to use 40.7 kilojoules for every one mole. So I just multiply that, 1.87 times 40.7, and I get 76.9, three significant figures again, 76.9 because of this number, kilojoules. Now, is it positive or negative? Well, to go from a liquid right here to a solid, I mean, sorry, to a gas, we have to add in energy. So this is a positive, it takes a positive 76. 0.9 kilojoules to turn it from a liquid to Okay, so let's continue now. We're at now at 13.4. Um, Not all substances heat at the same rate, and that's why that tongue was sticking to the pole, because the pole heats up fast. It has a very low specific heat. The amount of energy that raises one gram of something one degree Celsius is the specific heat. And substances with a high specific heat need a large amount of heat before it, the temperature goes up. And the formula, which was in that video, um, the, one of them is del, um, Q equals, oh sorry, MC delta T. Now this is a different M. This is the M is the mass of a substance. The Q is the thermal energy. It's going to be in joules or kilojoules. And the C is the specific heat. You'll get this off a chart. And the T is the temperature in degrees Celsius. So the higher the specific heat, the more heat it takes to raise the temperature. The lower the specific heat, the less heat it takes to raise the temperature. So wooden spoons take a lot of energy. Metal spoons take a little bit. So they t the metal spoons heat up quickly. They will take heat away from things quickly. Okay? So rates of cooling are also related to specific heat. Substances with high specific heat values retain heat for longer periods. Substances with low specific heat then cool off faster. So the warming curve of substance reveals it's a relative specific heat. Okay, so if the temperature rises quickly, 
with it, then the specific heat is low. This means there's a small amount of heat results in a large change of temperature. A gentle slope on a warming curve means, means that a high specific heat because the heat does not change the temperature very much. Okay, we're going to try to draw these on your notes. So for let's draw this and please try to copy this in your notes. Okay, we're going to draw the warming curve for both of these guys. Now if it has a high specific heat, that means it, it needs a lot of energy to raise the temperature, to increase the temperature. It have a, if it has a low specific heat, it means it needs a little amount of energy, a little energy, a little heat energy to increase the temperature. Okay? So when you're doing this, the temperature can be measured on the this side right here, the y-axis. So the temperature is going to go up. You know, maybe it starts off at zero and it goes up from there to 100. But that will be the same for both of them, okay? It's hard to write sideways, by the way. Okay, so this down here at the bottom will be heat. I'm adding in heat. And the heat's in kilojoules or in joules. And it might go from zero kilojoules to a thousand kilojoules. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I'm adding in heat for both of these guys in kilojoules. Now, if it's a high specific heat, I have to add a lot of heat energy to raise the temperature. So I have to add a lot of this before the temperature will go up. So you'll have a very sl slow curve as the temperature goes up. And finally, the phase change, the latent heat happens, and another very slow increase, and another latent heat, and another slow increase. So you see, this is the gentle slope. It has a very, it takes a long time to raise the temperature. The temperature doesn't go up very quickly from here to here. But if it has a low specific heat, it only needs a little tiny bit of energy. See how much energy this, this is a lot of energy in here to raise the temperature. But if it has a low specific heat, it only needs a tiny bit of energy for the energy, for the heat to go way up. So here, we got just a little bit of energy. The temperature went way up. And then you have the latent lazy heat and then temperature spikes again and the latent lazy heat and it spikes again. So low specific heat requires low amounts of heat to raise lots of temperature. So I hope you've got that in your notes. If you don't, you know, take a moment to go ahead and copy it. Now we're going to do a couple examples here. Um, if I have 942 joules of thermal energy added to 50 grams of water at 25.1 degrees Celsius, what will the final temperature be? I'm asking for T. So Q equals MC delta T. I, I memorized that one pretty easy. Q equals MC delta T. Okay, delta T, remember delta T is the final temperature minus the initial temperature. It's always the final temperature minus the initial temperature. Okay, now let's see what they gave us. They gave us 942 joules, that's your Q, because Q stands for the joules, so 942 joules. They gave us 50 grams, that's the mass, 50 grams. Then I'd have to look up what is the, the C, the specific heat of water, so I'm going to look at your reference sheet. So specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram, there it is, per degree Celsius. 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. There, 4.18, and this was 4.184. I'll go ahead and use the extra sig fig. So 4.184, I got that off the chart. 4.184 joules divided by grams degrees Celsius. Okay? Um, that's, a const that's something you look up. It's not a constant, but it's something you look up. All right, now, delta T. I'm going to calculate the change in the temperature first because that's the only thing I'm missing here. So I'm going to stop it for a minute and solve for delta T. You just have to divide both sides by 50 grams and by 4.184 joules divided by grams degrees Celsius. And that means this will go away, and that's going to be your delta T. 
notice you get the grams cancel and the jewel and um, the joules cancel. There we go, right there. So degrees Celsius is the only thing you have. So you have to just put that in. And okay, I got four point five zero two eight. We got to look at sig figs. This one has three significant figures right here. Um, three significant figures. Don't count this one because I looked it up. So I need three significant figures. So it's 4.50 degrees Celsius is the change in the temperature. Delta T means change in T for temperature here. So that's the change in the temperature. That, but this is asking me what the final temperature is. It's asking me for T sub F, the final temperature, final T. So I put this change in temperature directly in the formula. So 4.50 equals delta T sub F rather minus the initial temperature, which was 25.1. That's what that we started out as. And so now I just add that to both sides. So I will know what the final temperature is. It's 29.60. Remember that this is the value we calculated. So we got to keep those two decimal places. So 29.60 is the final temperature. All right, let's try another one. We have um, a 28 gram sample of silver, which is, you know, AU. It's heated from, from, heated from, keyword here, heated from, so that's my initial temperature, from 15 degrees Celsius to 85, so that's my final temperature. How many joules, that's the Q, how many joules were added to the sample? Q equals MC delta T. I'm asking for Q this time. The mass of the silver is 28 grams. I have to now go look up the specific heat, the C of the silver. So let's go to our graph and see if it's on here. Um, I have gold. I don't have silver, specific heat of silver. Let me go look that in a different spot real quick. Oh, by the way, silver is a G, not a U. Sorry about that. I always get those confused. AG, gold is AU. It's, I don't know, it seems backwards. This is the C for me, the C. I had to go look it up in the textbook. Um, I will make sure that all the values you need are in your reference chart for homework, as I because I did not see silver on my list here. So um, I wasn't expecting to use that one here, but I went and looked it up for you. So we have the C, now we have to do delta T. Well, delta T, we, have to, we can calculate delta T is T final minus T initial. So I can go ahead and put that here. The final temperature of 85 minus the initial temperature of 15. So there's your delta T. Now I can uh, do Q. So the, notice that the uh, grams cancel. The delta, the degrees Celsius will cancel because 85 minus 15 is what? Um, 70 degrees. And it's got to have two decimal places because of one's place here. So that those C's will cancel. So I end up with 28 times 0.23 joules times 70. And the degrees Celsius canceled, but there's the decimal place. And the final answer is 450 joules. 450 joules. That's how much energy it took to heat up the silver from 15 degrees to 85 degrees. Okay, get that in your notes. That brings us to a complex thermodynamic problem. We're not going to cover that in this video. We'll cover that in the next video. Let's go back to the Prezi for a moment and see if there's anything we need to, to look at. Here I'm just showing you um, different charts with the delta heat of fusion and it has melting points. These are the same things that are on your reference charts. This is another one that has the fusion and the vaporization. These are the same things that are on your reference charts and the specific heat. Now this I wanted you to see is that the higher the specific heat, the more energy is needed to change the temperature. So notice water needs a lot of energy to change its temperature. And then um, metals down here like copper and silver, they don't need a lot of energy to change the temperature. For me personally, this means in church when my hands get hot, I can put them on some kind of metal part of my seat that I'm sitting on and it cools my hands off. The heat leaves my hands and goes into that metal at church, okay? And there's the, again, the video. So we had this video again where he's going to stick his tongue to that pole. 
and um, it's taken forever. I'm going to let it move forward just a little bit. And now that we know a little bit about specific heat, we know metal heats up faster, takes heat away from other things, and heats up faster than um, most things. Why does his tongue stick to that pole? What well, sticks to the pole because, uh, because the heat leaves your tongue and goes into the pole, and that means the saliva on your tongue froze. And I was trying to get it to, to go a little bit farther, but that's okay. We can look at this more at school if we need to. All right, we did all this, and I think that we are finished looking at all the different aspects of our notes. That notice, I wanted to show you this too. We're going to get to a complex thermodynamic problem, and there's going to be a tutorial right there, so you'll be able to access it. Okay, that's the end of this first video for Chapter 13.